Ryan Brown. I've got my stormwater shirt on. I'm ready to go <laughs> to talk about stormwater. So um, happy to be here. Been a solutions engineer for Innovise for about three and a half years, uh, but came from consulting, doing a lot of uh, drainage design and uh, other kinds of FEMA compliance and things like that. Um, got with me uh, Midori. Uh, you want to introduce yourself? Sure thing. Uh, my name is Midori Patterson. I'm in the same role here. Uh, same role as Ryan here at Innovise, part of Autodesk, um, have been here for about seven months now, um, but have done some of these webinars before. So, um, yeah, excited to be here and talk yeah. about InfoDrainage. Yep. So uh, first off, this will be recorded. Um, if you did sign up for it or if you have uh, fellow colleagues that signed up for it, uh, they will get a follow up email in a few days with a link to the recording. Uh, we normally hold these things every two weeks, every other Tuesday uh, at 12 Eastern. Uh, we are skipping next week just because of uh, the Thanksgiving holiday and uh, getting back into the swing of things uh, just after that. And so we will wrap up the year uh, on 12-13. Uh, really just kind of a quick series of uh, different tips within InfoWater Pro, InfoWorks ICM, and Info Drainage. I'm uh, going to kind of spend 20 minutes on each one of those with just some uh, basic kind of look at um, you know what's going on with those softwares and, and how you can be uh, more successful with those. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Midori for the first couple of slides. Yeah, so this is just kind of a brief agenda for, for this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, but our talk will kind of follow this general structure about how to ensure your drainage designs are sustainable, safe, and compliant. Um, I'll first give just a brief highlight of an Autodesk article that was put out recently um, talking about one of the benefits of green infrastructure from a sustainability standpoint. Um, then we'll kind of have an even briefer discussion kind of about safety and, and what that means for engineers and hydraulic modelers. Um, but the bulk of the presentation, kind of like Ryan mentioned earlier, I'm kind of focused on both safety and compliance. Um, and so we'll go through some of the comparisons of of info drainage results to uh, other industry standards and other industry methods that are out there. So on, I think it was, yeah, October 25th is the date that was on this article, um, but this Urban Heat Islands article was published in um, Autodesk Redshift, which is Autodesk blog that kind of highlights topics from, from all of the industries that Autodesk serves. Um, but this stat kind of at the top, uh, in the past year, 7,000 heat records were broken across the United States. So depending on where you guys are calling in from, some of us, if not all of us, have kind of experienced some of these heat waves firsthand. I know just this Labor Day, I was in San Diego and temps got into like the mid 90s, which might not sound that hot, but when you're in kind of a concrete area, um, nowhere really has AC because it doesn't typically get that hot there. Um, and there, it wasn't breezy at all. So it just really was sweltering. Um, and so, yeah, when you're in that city, you can start to feel that heat way more because of things like uh, different kinds of heat sponges like asphalt or just reflections off of glass buildings or waste heat from just tons of air conditioning units just blasting out hot air um, and also just that wind blocking aspect of being surrounded by taller buildings. Um, all of these things are kind of what can contribute to uh, this urban heat island effect and so People are really looking to, to architects and urban designers um, and the engineers that they hire to get their projects built um, to kind of help alleviate some of these conditions in cities. Um, it's kind of an interesting issue as well because it does disproportionately affect uh, poorer, poorer areas of neighborhoods that might not have as many parks or, or green spaces or things like that that can start to kind of mitigate these these heat islands. Um, and so there are solutions to it, or perhaps not solutions, but ways that you can mitigate some of these um, some of these features, such as passive design, having water features, um, having shade and greenery. So things like green infrastructure can can actually start to help um, alleviate, alleviate some of those heat island effects. And if we just go to the next slide. Um, and there is a lot of literature out there about uh, the cooling effects of green infrastructure. 
uh, including the study that was done in Europe by a handful of different agencies and different universities. Um, but one of the key findings there was that uh, green areas in European cities can actually cool the ambient temperature there by uh, one degree Celsius on average, but sometimes up to 2.9 degrees. So putting that into Fahrenheit, that's about four degrees Fahrenheit on average, but up to six and a half ish degrees um, in kind of the, the best case scenarios, um, which, which makes sense. I think we can all kind of imagine that being in a grassy area with trees is going to feel cooler than being in just a you know a concrete jungle. Um, but up at the top right here is kind of a screenshot from a different Autodesk solution called SpaceMaker, which kind of helps more on the planning and architecture side. Uh, but as you can see by the diagram below, green infrastructure is kind of another aspect that can help cool these urban areas and um, can yeah, assist in, is, assist in that process. So anyways, that was just a cool article that was published recently. Um, and I'll post a link to that article in the chat if anybody's interested in reading more. So as I mentioned a little bit, you know, people are really looking to, to the architects and engineers to kind of help um, alleviate some of these, these issues. And, and engineers are under this increased pressure to not only make space is more enjoyable, but really to make things safer. Um, you know, these heat waves aren't just inconvenient and we aren't just kind of extra sweaty or anything, but these can actually kill people. Um, and so safety in the engineering and construction industries, it's not anything new and it's easy to see how it directly applies to things like on a construction site, right? Um, and even on in terms of, you know, a design engineer, it's a little easier to understand kind of what safety means there. Um, but what does it mean in the term of in the realm of, of hydraulic modeling, right? So as modelers, you know, we're sometimes not making those ultimate design decisions, but we just have to inform those decisions. And there's a safety aspect inherent to this as well. So what safety really means in the realm of hydraulic modeling is having a model that is as accurate as possible so that when we do go and design and subsequently build that solution, we're doing so with confidence in how that system is actually going to perform. Um, so with that accuracy piece kind of in the back of our minds, um, I'll pass that over to Ryan, who will talk about info drainage, um, talk about how it can help ensure that accuracy uh, and kind of move into that compliance realm by comparing it with some existing methodologies. Yeah, so um, just kind of starting off, um, I'm sure as everyone uh, is aware, especially if you've worked in uh, many different states and municipalities that everyone kind of has their own um, approach to uh, drainage design standards. And just by Googling it, you can see uh, many different things there. Um, I think at the core, at the end of it, at the end of the day kind of thing, um, a lot of these principles and things like that are, are fairly similar in terms of the standards, uh, in terms of what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, beyond this, a lot of cities and states and things like that will have lists of approved uh, manuals. And, um, you know, just because it's on this list doesn't necessarily mean it's a better solution or uh, there's a better approach or something like that. Um, and even uh, with info drainage, for example, uh, that's clearly not on this list. Some of our other products like uh, InfoWorks and XP Swim um, are, but uh, at the end of the day, Info drainage is using a swim five engine. So, um, you know, if it's being approved uh, to use the EPA swim uh, model, uh, why why shouldn't info drainage also be uh, allowed in those cases? Um, so, just looking at some of the principles involved with uh, green infrastructure and incorporating that, uh, like Midor was saying uh, before, more and more of this is being incorporated and being able to uh, mitigate against things like um, <coughs> flooding just encouraging that infiltration uh, and being able to store the water and, and slow it down. Um, there's a lot of benefit to this in terms of um, stretching out that um, hydrograph and, and uh, basically the, the idea here uh, and what we're gonna is, is by not modeling these things and not seeing these things uh, in conjunction with more traditional uh, types of uh, infrastructure, uh, there might not be, um, you might be not be seeing the whole picture and, and being able to uh, have everything um, uh, modeled so completely. 
Um, so just looking at the physics-based hydraulic, um, like I mentioned, Info Drainage does use the open source Swim 5 engine. Uh, these are uh, based on solving the, the 1D shallow water equations uh, using the dynamic wave method. Um, so familiar with the Swim 5 engine, uh, there's you know the kinematic wave methodology as well as the dynamic wave. Uh, we've kind of taken out the guesswork of what exactly, uh, what what module you should use and what solution you should use, um, because at the ultimately um, the dynamic wave uh, approach is is much more accurate than the kinematic wave, uh, especially once you get to the point of um, building out uh, models and then. Um, and then surcharging conditions and things like that. Um, but basically, the idea here is to be able to represent those different storage layers, uh, model the um, the amount that's in, that's being stored, the, uh, if there's an underdrain, how much is going through that, and how much is ultimately going back into the uh, groundwater itself. Um, so, not not a comprehensive look at all the different methodologies out there uh, for being able to size things. Some of the common ones, um, some of the engines out there for uh, certain softwares will use the Muskingum controuting method. Uh, this often will produce fairly conservative results, uh, especially once you get to the point of surcharging and uh, those pipes become under pressure. Uh, there's often a lot of workarounds that are needed for more complex situations like um, uh, diverging flows and things like that, uh, and then often because of these conservative results, we're we're often oversizing these structures using this this methodology. Same kind of thing with spreadsheets. Um, however, there's even less that's uh, uh, connected with it. Um, also, it can be very error prone. Even putting together this uh, presentation here, I, I noticed a, uh, an error in my spreadsheet that I um, didn't see before. Um, but had, was putting together some results and noticed uh, something was off. And lo and behold, I went back and, and um, had to fix some things in my um, my analysis. Um, but easy to produce, uh, overly conservative designs. Uh, ponds aren't connected. It's really just routing things using continuity principles. Uh, and then often, uh, again, difficult to represent multiple, um, multiple basins interacting with each other, co complex situations that might be going on versus info drainage, uh, being able to have everything in, in one full package, all of the hydrology, hydraulics in the same thing. Uh, they're all, all the different parts are interacting with each other and, and whatever else. Um, again, the Swim 5 engine using the dynamic wave analysis, uh, and then also having uh, just validation and auditing tools to uh, reduce any kind of errors that, that might uh, be occurring. So uh, going on to some of the comparisons, um, this is uh, MHFW stands for the Mile High Flood District. Uh, this is in the Denver area, um, and uh, basically uh, I put together a, a comparison using their uh, spreadsheet uh, compared to the performance within info drainage. Um, the uh, Mile High Flood District spreadsheet is required to be used by uh, the Mile High Flood District in the Denver area uses a modified pools method for routing. Um, so the, and then also uh, just because spreadsheets are, are separated, they're analyzed independently. Um, and that the outlet structures and in, in pipe, the outlet structures are sized in there, but the pipes and, and things like that need to be uh, sized in um, different ones. Not to knock their spreadsheet, there's a lot of um, PhDs and macros and different things like that for being able to put together a pretty comprehensive uh, pond. But um, as you'll see, uh, as we go through here, how things uh, compared to each other and um, what, what things look like. Um, this was an actual um, development out in uh, the southern, so just south of uh, the Denver area, I think in Colorado Springs this area, uh, where they were developing a 5,000 acre uh, site, uh, plot site, or a 5,000 plot uh, site um, for uh, small residential homes. Uh, info drainage, on the other hand, uh, again, having all the stormwater control measures and the pipe sizing and all that uh, within it, Swim 5 engine, uh, routing subject to the continuity equations, uh, same kind of thing as the modified pools, uh, and then also has calculators and things like that in, in lieu of the macros and things like that within the uh, spreadsheet there. Um, 
So the ponds were already designed uh, again because they're they're required to be using that Mile High Flood District spreadsheet, uh, and then uh, for the inflow hydrographs, uh, those were also in the spreadsheet, and I just extracted those uh, from the spreadsheet. So we're we're not really comparing the uh, hydrology methods um, between the two softwares. Uh, it, it is using the Colorado unit you know, hydrograph procedure. And then I just looked at the 25 year storm uh, in terms of um, my analysis and, and putting everything together. Uh, the ponds uh, and the pipe network and the outlet structures were all recreated with inf info drainage uh, identically uh, or as well as possible. Um, all of the, the ponds for sure, um, since the pipes weren't in there, I, I did have to make some um, uh, assumptions just based on the plans or I guess based on the plans I was able to uh, put together things like the traps little channels if it's outletting into that uh, or the different pipe networks within there. Uh, so this was a look at the uh, one of the ponds uh, called D1 they're all letter based um, but as you can see uh, the mile high flood district spreadsheet compared to the info drainage uh, lots, lots and lots of differences uh, for one there's more volume in this one uh, there's these instances of uh, much higher flow there is this decrease in flow uh, and then also just in general a longer drain time for uh, getting all the water out of the pond um, so I first put this together and I was pretty surprised how different the results could be uh, between the two. And then I went back and looked at my model. Um, this is the pond that we're looking at, uh, D1. Uh, you can see I've got a uh, pipe network um, coming into pond E, which then discharges into pond D1, and then that subsequently discharges into another pipe network uh, downstream. So really, uh, the idea was the spreadsheet doesn't have all those connections and with each other. So it doesn't see that there's more water coming in uh, from some upstream ponds. Um, and um, from from what I know, uh, this is a very common setup in uh, the Denver area for these types of developments uh, where you got a lot of interconnected ponds and uh, things like that. And um, so a very common kind of issue. So uh, in order to compare the methods on a, a much more holistic basis, uh, I decided to uh, just uh, basically trim the model, cut out all the pipes and, and replicate it so that all the pipes or all the ponds were being uh, analyzed independently. So once I did that, um, oh yeah, forgot about that one. So multiple ponds, yeah, outlets into other pipe networks and other ponds. So that was what was causing some of those issues of higher volume and um, some uh, backup of the flow and things like that causing the decrease in the flow. Once I disconnected everything, uh, you can see here, um, it's not exactly the same kind of matchup, which uh, you can never expect uh, two analyses to be exactly the same, uh, just because of the different methodologies and coding that goes in uh, to the, the process, but uh, it is pretty, pretty close. Um, I wanted to take this kind of a step further uh, and actually compare the methods uh, using some statistical uh, analyses. So uh, I kind of took something from uh, model calibration, uh, something that's commonly uh, done there just to understand how well the observed data looks to the uh, um, predicted data. So uh, first step is to calculate the root mean squared error. This root mean squared error is basically um, um, yeah it's just a metric and then the uh, root squared ratio which is the root mean squared error divided by the standard deviation of the um, observation so basically i treated the um, the model uh, the spreadsheet data as the observed data and the model data as the predicted data uh, and then came up with this rsr value as you can see on the right here um, there are basically different ranges for what these need to be in order to be considered uh, good, uh, very good, satisfactory. Um, and this is all related to um, those predicted to observe values uh, in, in model calibrations. Uh, so once I calculated uh, those, uh, you can see on the right side, if you remember from the, the page before there, uh, we had the uh, um, RSR between 0 and 0.5 is very good. Uh, you can see all of these uh, met within that, that criteria. So the whole point here, uh, basically being able to demonstrate that, uh, you know, in info drainage, if you're analyzing the ponds independently, uh, you are uh, able to um, get similar, very, very similar results to what you would get with the uh, Mile High Flood District. Um, 
So if you're using that, why shouldn't you be able to use the uh, info drainage? Uh, and then you also get that added benefit of everything's interacting with each other. So you're getting an actual uh, picture of what's going on in the system rather than uh, simply um, assuming that everything's disconnected. Uh, so I also did some kind of hypothetical, uh, and I didn't clean that up, uh, opt optional subtitle goes here, um, but comparing some different uh, SEM sizing methods. Um, so like we mentioned earlier, the uh, spreadsheet, spreadsheet method and then also the Muskingum Kunj uh, routing uh, method that some uh, programs out there use. Uh, so this was very hypothetical. Um, this is actually one of the tutorials out of info drainage uh, that I had, and I uh, basically used this and, and optimized the design within uh, info drainage. Um, so looking at some of the hydrology, uh, again, I kept the hydrology uh, the same throughout each one of these analyses. I wasn't trying to compare uh, the different methodology, the different hydrology methods that get used. So I was using the same hydrograph and everything. But this is a look at the uh, existing to the proposed condition. So I designed it and optimized it um, in info drainage and also in those two other methods. So uh, some of the assumptions uh, being made with the, these different methods, uh, again, the hydrographs were all used uh, from InfoRanage to just pull those out and uh, just wanted to focus on the hydraulic calculations of things. Uh, the spreadsheet method doesn't include the bioretention. Um, uh, I, I tried putting it before, but uh, just kind of ran into some issues. So um, there is um, a little bit of storage that was lost there. Uh, the Muskingum Kunj method that I uh, used in another software uh, includes the bioretention of the same dimensions as the info drainage um, as a storage object. So uh, still able to uh, see the, I guess, benefit of the uh, storage that the bioretention has in that case. The volume for the bioretention wasn't really sized based on any kind of uh, performance metric, uh, just the one inch from that upper catchment. So one times, I think it was like four acres or something like that. Uh, that was the volume that I uh, just made the bioretention. Uh, and then it had those two outlets, one from the under drain uh, and then one from uh, trapezoidal weir. Uh, I the the criteria I was trying to meet was uh, that the maximum depth in the pond was four feet. Uh, it didn't necessarily have to be the same in each kind of analysis, uh, but this forced everything to go through the low flow orifice. Um, so basically sizing the pond so that the maximum water depth didn't get above four feet uh, and um, and was able to uh, mitigate against the peak flow. Uh, the peak flow uh, to not exceed the conditions. Again, the peak flows didn't necessarily weren't the same uh, between the proposed and the existing, um, or, or during all the different kinds of analyses in the proposed. Um, and uh, this was just looking at the ten-year event. Uh, so, looking at the chainsaw uh, routing comparison. Um, this is the comparison between that. So uh, if you're not familiar with chainsaw routing, uh, this is a pretty common uh, method. It's basically you've got an inflow coming in uh, and then you've got an outflow based on the amount that can fit through an orifice. Uh, and then uh, basically it's going back and forth. Um, the amount that isn't able to leave uh, from the inflow through the orifice uh, just gets added onto the volume. So. Uh, very just kind of back and forth um, type of analyses. And as you can see in this case, uh, pretty similar outflows in terms of the peak, actually a little bit higher for the outflow here. But again, meeting those uh, criteria of the um, of the um, requirements there. Uh, so we've got the info drainage design um, showing some of the lag uh, and things like that as, as water goes into the bioretention, uh, being able to slow down the uh, amount of water getting out of the system um, and being able to mitigate that against, uh, against that a little bit better. Uh, again, didn't have the bioretention in the spreadsheet method, um, but uh, part of the reason uh, for not showing any kind of lag is um, it wouldn't be able to uh, detect those those kinds of differences. The other big difference uh, between the two, uh, like I mentioned, the max stage uh, under four feet and the max discharge um, was uh, 1.82. Uh, I believe for the existing conditions, it was like 1.9 or something like that. Uh, uh, but the big difference here uh, between the two, um, the 
chainsaw routing method, I needed a little over 10,000 square feet of um, um, top area. So at my, my five feet, um, compared to the info drainage, um, it was around 800 feet uh, to meet those same kinds of criteria. Uh, Muskingum Kunj routing comparison here. Uh, so again, uh, same kind of uh, outflow going on here uh, between the two, a little bit higher with the Muskingum Kunj. Uh, fewer data points on this. Uh, so that's why there's gaps within here. Um, these aren't lines, these are actually uh, points and they're just kind of plopped on top of each other. Uh, but you can see we achieved the peak at the same time. Uh, so we get that lag um, approach. Um, however, um, it, we, we have some differences on the on the downstream link um, and things like that just because of um, some of those routing differences. Big difference here. Uh, so if we look at the information uh, from here, we know the uh, info drainage uh, model uh, uh, showed 800 square feet as the uh, top area there. Uh, with the bottom width and the top length, we have a, a two to one side slope. And so uh, if we have five feet and we multiply the side slope against the, the feet there, we get 79 feet for the, uh, the uh, width and then 80 feet for the top width. And you can see we've got a little over 6,000 square feet that would be needed to um, achieve the same uh, types of performance metrics there. Uh, and so with this, I'll hand it back over to um, Nidori for uh, a real world comparison. And I, and I guess just wrapping up, um, again, that was a hypothetical look. Um, honestly, I'd love to do more comparisons and see how things match up between uh, different methodologies used around the country. Uh, really, really good stuff. Yeah, thanks so much, Ryan. Um, so this, I guess, a brief overview of what this study was. Um, uh, did the bullet points not show up? <laughs> oh, I think I just have to click. Oh, okay, okay, there they go. Okay, there go. I was like, that is interesting. Um, yep. But anyways, this was a pond in um, Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, and so the Institute of Ecology and Resource Management at the University of Edinburgh um, did this study. They were kind of looking at different uh, out in the UK, they call it SUDS, which is basically just uh, sustainable urban drainage systems, which incorporates green infrastructure, LIDs. Um, basically, it's the same concept. They just have a different name for it. But they were looking at different SUDS structures uh, and basically putting in some flow monitoring devices to see how these things are actually performing. Um, they had uh, monitoring devices on the inlets of these ponds and the outlets so that they could trace these flows and, and kind of see how these structures are performing. Um, so some of their studies and the things that they were looking at uh, included those flow rates, which I mentioned earlier, but they were also looking at water quality, uh, microbi microbiological qual quality, sedimentation, sediment quality, and ecological quality. Um, this, uh, there's a picture of this pond down at the bottom right, has a bottom of a uh, volume of about uh, 2,700 cubic yards. Um, it was previously an agricultural pond, but as they were doing this roadway project, um, they basically converted that agricultural pond into a uh, detention detention facility for the um, for some of the drainage off that roadway. Um, but what essentially some of the the teams in the UK did. So they had these results, they went through, they rebuilt this model in info drainage and they rebuilt it in a different software package and just wanted to look at those results, see how info drainage modeling of this pond compared to the modeling of, uh, obviously compared to those real world results, but then also how it compared to other methods. Um, so on this next slide, we can view the results of that study. Um, and so here, the observed inflow is in blue. Um, so you can see where some of those uh, hydrographs are, or some of those items are peaking. Um, and then the observed outflow is in red. And then the modern approach outflow, which was info drainage, um, is in yellow. And then the traditional method, which was a different software package, um, is in gray. And so you can see here, 
pretty clearly just how well the info drainage model results um, line up with the uh, actual observed outflow that was measured at this pond. Um, and on the next slide, we can kind of talk about some of those reasons why, you know, Ryan's really kind of covered them um, with just some of the uh, different performance uh, kind of enhancements within info drainage and just the things that that software does uh, that other softwares don't. So kind of in, in addition to those things that Ryan already mentioned, you know, one is just that there's advanced parameters to kind of reflect the physical reality. So you can see over on the right hand side what that info drainage pond actually kind of looks like versus the other software program where it is just you know modeled as a triangle. No matter how big your pond footprint's going to be, that triangle doesn't really uh, change size. So again, that's just kind of a an error. You know that doesn't really the graphical representation doesn't reflect the engine calculations by any means, but basically just kind of minimizes the room for error um, as you're laying out these pods and as you're designing them. And then secondly, this is kind of what Brian was talking about too. Uh, in info drainage, you can account for those multiple layers of infiltration through filter media. Um, you can have those numerous outlet configurations and backwater conditions just so that you can get a more accurate result. Um, and then again, you, using that SWIM-5 engine with that dynamic wave equ equation, which is an industry well-known standard uh, for 1D modeling. And also, like Ryan mentioned, um, you know, by using that dynamic wave equation rather than the kinematic wave equation, we've kind of taken out that guesswork for you just because this is a more accurate um, and comprehensive solution of those equations. Oh. And then, well, yeah, that last quote, yeah. <laughs> it's no. basically the same as that first point, but yeah, yeah. Uh, less room for error with, with better graphical representation. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, that's that's a bulk of the presentation. Um, didn't think we'd we'd necessarily spend the full hour, but we do have some questions uh, that came in. And Midori, do you have uh, an instance of info drainage? Maybe we could show some of these. Uh, um, I can get reason. one open in okay. just a sec, but I can too. But I was trying to open it up earlier and um, was running into some issues. Yeah, I can open it up. Um, but I guess just starting off and, and reading some of these uh, while we're waiting, um, I'm assuming we can use uh, use our own rainfall intensity numbers based on our local drainage authorities. Uh, yes, all of that is uh, uh, fully customized uh, in being able to, oh, I got it up now. Um, so yeah, this is a look at info drain and um, in that rainfall information that's, uh, whoops, I need to change my regionalization. Um, it's using a UK model, um, just cuts down on the number of things I'm seeing. So uh, yeah, so um, the NOAA rainfall uh, is built into here. Um, so you can actually uh, click around on this map. It updates the latitude and longitude. You can come up with a full ensemble of storms for different distributions. Um, there's also the SES method. So this is just basically typing in uh, those values here. And there's also a link directly onto uh, NOAA's website to be able to pull that information off as well. Um, the other thing that's in here is user defined. So you have some user defined uh, distributions. Uh, you can create these from IDEA, but if you have some different uh, standards like the Huffington uh, temporal distributions and things like that, those can be uh, coded in here. Um, and like a lot of the things in info drainage, um, whoops, that's not what I want to show. Um, in the rainfall manager, you can actually save these as templates and use them across different projects. Um, and then there's also imports for uh, those IDF curves and tables. Um, does your software also do dual uh, dual stage detention where one detention uh, pipes come into another detention pond? Yes, um, I guess we're talking about maybe interconnected ponds and being able to uh, model multiple uh, types of things interacting with each other and, and things like that. Um, I guess the other thing you could be asking is the outlet information. So you can have uh, multiple outlets in here. 
uh, being able to uh, incorporate them. I've only got one for this case, but I can uh, add another. I can uh, switch what outgoing pipe it's at um, or create more uh, in that dialogue, uh, but lots of different options for that. Um, and then also kind of related to this, does your software have an overflow uh, structure design. Um, yes, all that is also built into here. Uh, so we have this, uh, these little calculators. Uh, so for the orifices, we just design, we buy some design that we're trying to meet. Um, so as you type in that information, it's going to give you a diameter uh, for that low flow orifice. If you hit OK, it's going to update it there. I can switch this to uh, the overflow weir. Uh, so if I look at the calculator here, uh, same idea, being able to uh, specify some design criteria and, and design flows that I'm shooting for, uh, along with that coefficient of discharge for the Weir equation, uh, and then the width that's needed for uh, meeting some of those uh, criteria. Uh, um, oh gosh, we've got lots of... <laughs> yeah. So I think, I mean, that kind of covers the the question of uh, how it has. Uh, um, the other question was, does your software have an overflow structure design? So. Yeah, I just I was surprised. That and that overflow structure to come and then the sizing calculators um, in there as well. Um, but the next question was, are there drainage area analysis tools to determine curve numbers and runoff coefficients? Yeah, um, I'm going to say kind of. Um, this is actually something that came up recently, but we do have this pervious curve number calculator in here. So this is just a, a table, um, you know, instead of having to pull this up from a, a web source or from uh, whatever else, uh, all that is, is coded in here. Um, there uh, is not any kind of like weighted thing. So if you have different, if you're pulling off land uses, uh, and soil types and want to get a curve number based on those two things. Um, there are some methods using um, using ArcGIS to be able to do like weighted curve numbers and stuff like that. Uh, it's also something that I've passed on to our uh, product development team for uh, consideration of uh, incorporating something like that. So basically ingesting the soil shape file, the land use shape file, and then coming up with an aggregate um, previous curve number. Uh, so hopefully we can get that into development. Um, can you talk about the stability of routing of SWIM5 in, in info drainage? Um, well, like we've been reiterating uh, on this, it is using the dynamic wave equation um, in, in its analysis. So um, even if you go to the help menu, um, I forgot where it is exactly, but uh, we, we explicitly state in there that it's using the dynamic equations, and the whole reason for that is because it is uh, a much more um, accurate uh, result. Um, the other thing that's kind of related into this is uh, choosing a time steps. Uh, there are convergence criteria, and again, with the help menu, you can find uh, more information about um, what the convergence criteria we've uh, set in there. Uh, but we do have just a few options for these different time steps, and uh, within the help menu, uh, there are certain ranges that default corresponds to, to what reduced means and what shortest means. Um, I think default is one to five seconds, reduced is 0 0.1 second to one second, and then shortest is maybe uh, point. I don't know what they are, but uh, shortest is, is the shortest range. And so if you run the analysis, um, you get a little warning. Uh, if it is sensing some stability issues going on, uh, it makes that suggestion for uh, reducing it. Um, it also gives you a, a link to the help menu showing where um, where you might have some issues, um, where some just configurations that might be uh, causing some issues. Um, so. Uh, good stuff in there. Um, yeah, and then I think the next question was, well, we got a comment that the NOAA rainfall feature is great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then the next new question edition. was, uh, yeah, yeah, that is a new addition. So if you had seen a previous version of info drainage, it wouldn't have been in there. Um, but next question was, can flows be diverted from various outfalls of a retention drainage feature to different slash separate downstream conveyances? Yeah, exactly. So um, let's just uh, put another pipe in here. Um, so it's just a matter of kind of 
dragging and dropping. Uh, once I do add that that outlet structure there, if I double click on my outlet now, um, I've now got that pipe as an option for being able to um, to to send whatever my whatever I choose my outlet type to be. Um, so send it to different locations um, depending on just how you have it set up. So um, definitely there. And then another question is, can you model streams in info drainage? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I guess the, the short answer is uh, to, to some extent. So uh, we've got a custom uh, channel here. So you could do a stream using that and do the cross-section of the uh, stream itself. Um, however, I'll say uh, info drainage isn't really built to model things like streams you'd, you'd probably likely use uh or another uh, another product we have in forks icm or um or uh or something like heckpress um but if i do put this in as an example and then open up uh the cross-sectional information you'll actually see there's a range uh down here at the bottom so uh these values uh, are in inches they can be between zero and um almost two thousand inches which if I remember correctly, is something like 20 feet. I don't know. Somebody could do the math on that. Um, uh, but it, it's it's pretty big where you can get out to. Uh, I know we've run into some issues where there's no real reason for that that range to be on there. It's just we don't want people modeling floodplains with this type of uh, tool just because it's not really built for that. Um, Uh, the next question was, and I apologize, everybody, I had to turn my camera off because I was having some internet issues. But um, anyways, does the program allow you to enter outflow data for custom outflow devices, such as Vortex valves? Yeah, um, I'm honestly not sure what this hydro break thing is, but it, it might be um, something similar uh, to what the Vortex valve is. Um, I think it's a UK proprietary thing. Uh, the other option we have is just a simple depth flow. Um, discharge table so if you have the, um, the if you have the uh, routing information uh, along with that then you could uh, in, include that as as kind of that custom uh, output uh, for sure uh, we got another question about does info have oh sorry nope does info drainage have 2d capabilities yeah yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so kind of in two ways, really. Uh, so we have this deluge option. Um, this is a 2D analysis, but it's not like a true 1D, 2D analysis where uh, you are specifying the minimum element area or dropping about two inches of water and letting it run around for about two minutes. This is truly a one or a 2D um, simulation uh, where that water drops and then it runs around to wherever it uh, gets to. And that's why we're specifying that minimum element area. Uh, the other option we have in here uh, is this true 1D, 2D analysis. So uh, you are selecting out a, a specific storm uh, from your rainfall library. You can increase the rainfall by a certain percentage uh, if need be. Uh, but same idea, specifying a, a Manning's in that's just kind of a generalized thing. It can be um, you know, a common one or just a user specified, um, and then also specifying that minimum element area. So as you run this, as water discharges from the different structures from the manholes, it's able to run around on the surface and uh, get back in if appropriate. Um, everything's connected up. Uh, fairly simple and easy to, to put up and um, put into here uh, in terms of not necessarily being a, a complex uh, type of setup like some of the other 2D softwares are, uh, but it is a pretty simplistic uh, analysis as well. Uh, if you compare the output results from info drainage of multiple uh, uh, SWMF, I'm not too familiar with that, um, guessing stormwater controls. Um, systems against XP swim models. Uh, no, we have not. Um, I would venture to guess that uh, it's going to be fairly similar. Uh, XP Swim uses a swim modified Swim 4 engine, so um, very similar. Uh, and if you're using the dynamic wave equations, because you do have that option to flip between uh, the kinematic wave and the dynamic wave equations within uh, XP Swim, 
I would assume if you're using the dynamic wave equations, there would be uh, fairly similar results between the two, uh, just because it is, uh, again, very similar engine and, and very similar analysis going on. Uh, what's the difference between swim and info drainage uh, runoff calculation method? I saw uh, info drainage uses a hydrograph. Um, hopefully, I can answer this. Uh, so there. Are runoff uh, methods. So some of the common ones, SCS, unit hydrograph. Uh, we also have a modified uh, rational method. Uh, and then also the swim methodology with some uh, different kinds of infiltration methodologies in here. So um, basically, this is the routing of how the water is getting to, um, and to the uh, point that it drains into, and then the infiltration method being the uh, method in which it's um, how much water is getting actually to the to the point uh, the volume of the water uh, based on these different loss methods hopefully i answered that well um yeah and then the next question was are you able to import existing contours for off-site drainage area delineations are you able to import oh um yes um so you can bring those in as background images. Um, so I've got one in here. Uh, it doesn't have any contours in it, but um, that background image is showing um, just the, the, the background, uh, what's going on uh, behind the scenes. So you could import uh, a DWG. Uh, it's also got this nice refresh file. So it is like a reference uh, with in here. Uh, you could also import GIS data as background data as well. So if you had the a shape file or something in a a geo database uh, to be able to bring that in um, as a background layer. Uh, there's also uh, within this plan menu up here, uh, different snapping tools. So um, being able to snap to uh, different objects and things like that. Um, likewise, if you already have those catchments drawn out, you can import them from uh, those sources as well from CAD and GIS. Uh, uh, we got a uh, comment from some of our support staff um, that 500 test files uh, uh, for the IFD are all stable. So I'm uh, just kind of speaking to that that stability question and being able to um, that, yes, yes, yes. Um, very, very stable in terms of uh, the results and being able to get that information or, or be able to uh, do those types of analyses. Um, can this model, uh, uh, can this model pumped ponds where the uh, bottom of the pond is lower than the outfall of the pond and it needs to be pumped. Uh, can this model uh, roadside ditches with multiple culverts in the ditch where flow will be dis uh, disrupted? For example, a subdivision where the driveway meets the old main road and all the driveway culvert impacts drainage. Um, I think the short answer to all that is yes. Um, mm -hmm. So if we go back to our BMP that we have in here, uh, there is an option for uh, a pump and there is also an option uh, for a level controlled pump. Um, I think this is it. Yeah, elevation control pump. So um, you have the the invert elevations and the cut in and cut out height. Um, but yes, uh, different options for uh, a couple of different types of uh, pipes going in there. Um, and then uh, I guess yeah, for the second part of that question. Um, Again, I think the short answer for that is yes, that uh, you've got these different options for being able to model roadside dish it, ditches, whether it's um, trapezoidal channels, whether it's triangular channels, rectangular channels, or that custom one that we showed a little bit earlier. Um, everything, again, is interacting with each other. So if you have um, a, a ditch going into a culvert, um, and if there's multiple ones there, it's just a matter of um, drawing more in there. So I can uh, draw any number of uh, culverts in here. Um, so if you have multiple barrels and things like that. Uh, likewise, in the uh, information itself here, um, I thought there was an option for including more barrels. Maybe there's not. Do you know if there's a, an option for including more barrels or am I making that up? Midori. I think I'm making it up. I think I'm thinking of another program. Uh, do you have rain or other 
built-in data for Canadian standards. Oh, man, um, no. Um, <laughs> we do have, uh, again, that customized um, customized temporal pattern. So maybe things like, um, uh, maybe things like um, the Chicago rainfall standards and things like that. Um, those are, um, those can be put in here, but there's nothing really built in for Canadian standards, unfortunately. Um, free trial available? Uh, yes. Um, so I, I guess both sides of that. Um, there is a free trial. If you go, if you just search for Autodesk Info Drainage, you'll um, likely come up with the product page fairly quickly. Uh, and up in the top left corner of the um, of the page there, there is a um, login for, or there's a button for free trial. Uh, um, so it's just a matter of filling out some information and then it uh, ultimately gets dumped into your uh, Autodesk account so you can access it from there. So um, along with that, um, there are tutorials in here. Uh, certainly encourage you guys to bring in your own uh, data and things like that and be able to populate um, this, these models with your own data and, and see how your own stuff works in here. Um, likewise, I'm always happy to kind of set up a, a demo and uh, walk through some different workflows and, and talk about some things in more detail, uh, uh, me or Midori or, or whoever else. Um, so we got that. Um, uh, can you show how on uh, offline bypass detention structure would be and analyzed? I got kicked yeah. out because of my internet connection. And I yeah, I saw you. And you were kind of like going in and out anymore, so. that's fine um <laughs> i'm reading through them i don't know that we're going to get through all of them geez um yeah sorry i was reading some other stuff um bypass detention um so there is this option for including bypass um bypass connections uh so any kind of um connection we have over here i can model it as a um as a bypass, and so if I include one of these here, uh, I can see that in my um, my inlet uh, now here, um, I I have the option for, or I have the bypass destination uh, for these different uh, inlets that I've just included in here. So uh, being able to uh, incorporate that is possible. It's not as simple as some of the other programs out there where you can just say it's going downstream uh, to the next node, uh, and that's just because it's a dynamic model. Uh, you need some of the information to be able to route the water through those. Um, I guess a better idea would be multiple stages of open ditch culvert in a path. Uh, I think that's related to the earlier question where we had, um, uh, we're talking about uh, culverts coming in and, and being able to have streams and ditches and things like that. Um, I think the answer would just be that it is a dynamic solution. So if you have um, ditches and culverts and things like that uh, at different elevations, so um, let's say you had a um, you know a culvert at one elevation, it's just a matter of putting it in just how it is uh, represented uh, physically. So being able to um, have those different pipe elevations, the different uh, channels that set at different elevations all of that's going to be taken care of once you get through the point of being able to um, put in um, put in the model so it's it's inherent to the way that the the solution is going um, see if we can get in here the arrows should be in the yeah um sorry there's just lots and lots of questions um so one issue we face in ssa is where uh if there's ever a negative uh hydraulic jump and you want to be conservative and change the value to 0.1 or 0.2 value at this structure will this software allow you to change that value in the storm hydraulics um honestly i'd have to get back to you on that i do a little more digging into it um uh, and uh, maybe i can send you an email and we can follow up um to talk through it in a little more detail um because i'm not exactly sure i would venture to guess possibly just because it is because ssa does use a swim engine as well also 
uh, might be some similar methodologies. Uh, can you import, export custom channels um, into the cross-section data, status quo is entering the station uh, and elevation uh, for each point along the channel? Um, so again, I think the answer to this is yes. Um, where's my, I'll just change this to a custom. Um, so you can type these in by hand, uh, but you can also load uh, CSVs. So if you have the, the XY information in a, a CSV format, then you can include those. Um, there is only one cross section for each, um, for each one. Uh, so you'd have to do, if you wanted to represent uh, different geometries as you're going downstream or something like that, that uh, you would have to have multiple uh, custom channels set up. Uh, model ditches and culverts. Uh, hopefully we've covered that one. The, the, the answer to that is, is basically yes. Um, and so we've got one on, uh, so is this software have a dynamic link back to civil 3D? Uh, if so, does the software understand null structures in civil 3D and what it represents in storm systems? Um, I need Midori, you have a lot more experience with some of the exchanges back and forth with civil 3D. Do you want to take that one? Sure. So it, it's not a fully dynamic link back with civil 3D. Um, kind of the most dynamic aspect of it is if you did have a DWG loaded in as a background layer, you can refresh it from info drainage. Um, but if you're making changes within info drainage, it's not automatically going into your civil 3D drawing and changing those things as you move through the design. So right now it is still, you know, you'll take your civil 3D pipe network from civil 3D, export it to info drainage, and in that process, you'll get a um the, there's a there's a if you use the civil 3d or the info drainage ribbon within civil 3d there will be a parts mapping process so you can um basically assign that null structure within your pipe civil 3d pipe network to a simple junction i think would be the congruent um info drainage piece um, but it steps through that for all that all the different elements that are in your civil 3D pipe network reads your civil 3D parts family, and you'll just have to manually assign what you want that to come in as in info drainage at first. Um, you can also you can save that uh, parts mapping configuration to use for multiple projects, um, and then take it to info drainage and do most of your drainage design there. But when you are ready to bring it back from info drainage to civil 3D, uh, you can do that if you do that within that. Uh, ribbon that I was mentioning earlier, it'll actually update that civil 3D pipe network, uh, maintain your reference alignments, maintain your reference surfaces so that um, basically those connections aren't broken and it is just an updated pipe network rather than a totally new um, duplicate uh, pipe network. Yeah, um, so we got a little more clarification on what the hydro break is from uh, some of the support staff here. Um, so it is a um, and it's called a hydro break flood alleviation is highly susceptible, uh, sustainable, uh, precision engineered vortex flow control that provides large scale protection at uh, water course level. So uh, not exactly sure if that's the same thing as the, the vortex valve, um, but sounds like it could be somewhat similar. Um, with that, uh, we're, we're at time, but there is uh, one more question I wanted to um, uh, just answer and then the rest of these uh, we'll, we'll reach out to you personally and, and be able to answer them for you as well. Uh, but how is info drainage different than Inforks ICM? Uh, the, the biggest difference for me between the two, Inforks ICM is very much a, a large scale analysis uh, watershed planning tool uh, versus info drainage is much more of a design tool. So uh, being able to have those exchanges with civil 3D, importing and exporting uh, information, uh, different uh, types of uh, validation tools in here and reporting tools to be able to um, show that things are being compliant, show that things are uh, meeting uh, certain regulatory requirements and that they're within uh, certain ranges and things like that. Um, I will say the one similarity between the two is the 2D analysis uh, on the back end here for both the deluge and the 1D, 2D analysis uh, are exactly the same between Inforks ICM and Info Drainage. It's using the same methodology. So 
Uh, hopefully that answers that. But uh, thanks everyone for uh, a ton of engagement. And, and like I mentioned, uh, we will um, follow up with some of these uh, to be able to uh, get you better answers um, or get some more answers for you. Um, but with that, we'll uh, end the in in the water talk. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Bye.